what has actually changed in the data world in the last decade. I recently made a video about what hasn't changed, like the problems that haven't changed. And there's a lot of things that haven't, but honestly, there's a lot of things that have changed, not necessarily in the problems, but in the way we approach solving said problems. And I wanted to go over a few of those things, talk about the technologies we're using now that we seem to jump to rather than what we did in the past, and kind of just the new norms that we, we do have. They're real, they are here. And so I wanted to talk about them uh, so to cover what are the five things that have changed in the data world, especially data engineering. So if you're coming in, if you're a data engineer looking to understand the tools, the technologies, what's actually changing, let's talk about it. All right, so number one is cloud tends to be the first choice. In the past, you know, we would often start with something like a SQL Server instance, because you could just download it onto your Windows computer, spin it up immediately, use the free version, the free tier, and start building your own uh, data warehouse. I mean, a lot of people I knew were just running their data warehouse underneath their desk on some leftover computer or tower. That was the way we would approach solving that problem. Nowadays, right, like people just immediately go towards Snowflake, BigQuery, Databricks, Usually those are the few that I see people start with. Obviously there are still some purists who love starting in Postgres, but overall it really is just this immediate jump to the cloud. It's free, it's already set up, you know, it has data you can already play with. It's great in that way. Like if you're trying to learn, I remember I would have to spend so much time if I, when I was trying to learn. You download SQL Server, you download uh, the SQL Server Management Studio, SSMS, then you have to upload some data to it and some of it would upload fine, but some of it in, inadvertently, your CSV was weird and so, you know, that would cause problems unavoidably. And so you have to spend some time figuring out how to load it correctly. But now you can just go to the cloud. BigQuery has a bunch of free data sets you can learn on. You can just spin up Snowflake for free and play with it for a little bit. And so that's what I see a lot of companies do is they just tend to jump towards the cloud. Same thing with tooling, right? You're not looking maybe for uh, tools that you download anymore. A lot of the tools that people use are just in the cloud. So there is this cloud first uh, kind of approach that I've noticed that everyone just jumps there whether it's more expensive or not is not the point that is just where i see people jump to along with that in terms of like tooling i don't see people jump to bash as often as like the first go around or some sort of scripting you know approach a lot of people just jump straight into like airflow or a more complex tool right when they're trying to load their data in either some people are will just go down the route of i coded this in python and uh, maybe use a Lambda to actually be the loading tool. But I see a lot more people jumping straight to things like Airflow, even if they don't know how complex their pipelines are going to be. Uh, that might be good or bad, but that does seem to be more of the natural way people do it. Part of that's probably because exactly about a decade ago, Airflow was open source. So it's not just Airflow. It is other tools as well, right? You've got Prefect, Dagster, Mage, all of these as options on how you could orchestrate your pipelines. And so all of these are becoming more and more options that I'm seeing every day. And so that's something I, I see less. It's like there's less of these like bash that call stored procedure approaches, right? Like that was really the way a lot of people would script these things. They'd have, you know, a Python or a bash script that was called via cron. You're seeing less of that, right? Like people are going to DBT, they're going to Airflow, they're going to things that exist out of the box and try to solve some of these problems. They've done great in terms of marketing, right? They, they're on all the like, what should you learn as a data engineer list. And that has really, I think, helped them become more popular. Again, whether you like it or not, I know a lot of people have mixed feelings on all these tools, like they're being used, right? Like these are tools that are being used. And I still see it on my deep tea video that has terrible audio. I'm sorry. I just see it all the time where people make references or make jokes and like, oh, why are we doing this, etc. It's like, whether you agree with it or not, people use it. And it's hard to, to deny that like airflow isn't being used and DBT isn't being used, right? They have gained popularity. Next, I want to talk about hiring, right? When I started hiring, there was there was definitely this space for juniors, right? And we've all seen the charts of like how hiring is going currently. You know, everyone wants to hire seniors. Uh, juniors are sadly kind of kind of in the decline. And I see this so often. Like, I think that's like the harder thing. It's not just the data that says this to me. It is the anecdotes. And if you've ever seen that quote from Jeff Bezos, where he talks about if the anecdotes and the data don't align, you should probably check your data, right? Your data is probably hiding something. I'm going to put up the quote because that's not the exact line, but the point is, right, there is something to be said that like I have anecdotes and there's data. And so I do believe this is what is happening. It is more people want problem solved. And that's, that's the thing. When you hire a junior, there's a lot more training that's involved. There's a lot more space that you have to spend, you know, helping them grow in the right ways to get to a point where they can operate in the business well. And that's not me taking a knock. Like I, I know that there were mistakes that I made that were really dumb as a junior and having like a senior engineer be there with me and mentor me really is what grew me and made me better. And so we, one, cannot have this happen, right? Like we, 
we're going to need to fix this problem because there will be a point like senior engineers leave. And I don't know the exact statistics, but I've seen like most engineers tend to be in that uh, 20 to 35 year range. And then, you know, as, as time goes on, there are less. Some of that could be because, you know, a big percentage of, of the new software engineers have become software engineers have been only in the last, you know, few decades. So that could be a part of it. But I do feel like there tends to be this like eventual frustration with the space or, or people want to try new things or whatever it might be that like takes them to a new role that I, I often talk to people who are maybe in software sales. And it's like, oh, yeah, there, there's always this story of like, I used to code in whatever uh, I used to be a software engineer, or whatever. And either they found that they can make more money doing sales or they just didn't want to code anymore. So I do think there's some natural uh, transitioning away. And so we will need more junior engineers at my point because they have to become seniors. I think this gives an interesting opportunity, um, right? Like every problem is an opportunity. Uh, I'm actually talking to a few friends who are trying to build some tooling around this where you can essentially create a senior engineer that helps a junior engineer become a senior engineer uh, via AI. It's an interesting idea. I do think there's an aspect of people that is hard to take out. Like we do need people to help us grow. But I can see that being part of the future where we're going to have to like almost code some of whatever it is that you, you kind of get from a senior engineer, that com combination of mentorship, that combination of like looking through their code and learning, combination of like learning how to debug. I think that's a big thing, which I, I haven't seen AI do that well on generally. So, you know, we'll see if that works, but it, it's true. We, like, we need to make sure we keep hiring junior engineers because we need future senior engineers. And that, that, I, I view that as a big problem, but I do just keep having conversations where people are like, we want senior and they've got no one else but seniors hired. And so it works great in some ways because you get your problem solved. It will probably eventually become too expensive because there's only so many senior engineers and eventually it'll just become too high of a demand and, and that'll be great for senior engineers, but not great again for the whole, the space as a whole. Another thing that I'm seeing change is that the discussions we used to have about x versus y is becoming less of a problem or at least it's becoming different that is to say for example in the past you might have to do like presto versus spark or streaming versus batch and there's a lot of tooling now or just different patterns that we're trying to create that try to accommodate more of these options right a compute agnostic approach in some cases right where because you use maybe apache iceberg or some similar solution you now right? Have an option on what compute you actually use. You can use Presto, you can use Spark. Um, similarly, uh, this is just my own little tuning of the horn, at least for the company that I'm working with, Estuary, who just raised their Series A. Congrats, guys. Honestly, you guys work so hard. They're making that bridge between streaming and batch and making it easier so you don't have to pick. And I think this is kind of part of the future, right? Like, why should we be picking which compute we want to use? Why can't I use DuckDB or Presto or Spark? You know, depending on what I need to run, depending on what could be cheaper or maybe faster. You know, again, we, we actually were able to do this at Facebook. We could say like pick Spark, Presto or Gross Hive. Um, no, nothing against Hive, but we were definitely, we had phased that out by the time I left. But you could make that choice. And that allowed you to have certain jobs that allowed you to benefit from Presto and other jobs that allowed you to benefit from Spark. And I'm sure maybe even now they've got DuckDB in there. I don't know. Someone, if you work at Facebook, let me know. If you're using uh, DuckDB, that'd be cool to know. But yeah, you would benefit from that. And so I do think people are trying to make these options less of a choice and more of, again, an option. Like it should be an option. I see that as just something that is going to continue, right? Like tools need to be more flexible, whatever they might be. Our patterns need to be more flexible because we want to be able to switch between uh, different computers. We want to switch between different patterns, whether it's event-based, streaming, et cetera. Like we want to be able to pick the approach we take. And I think that is something that tooling will uh, start to meet, at least those types of needs. Finally, my last point is that AI is changing workflows, right? Like it does. Like I've talked, like anyone you talk to, for better or for worse, either is using ChatGPT, is using cursor somewhere in their flow. It's interesting. Like some people are still doing the copy paste approach. Some people have it naturally in their flow. And they, there's various reasons. Some people don't like the fact that however cursor might be going into your code, it doesn't edit it the way you want. So they're like, it's just easier to do copy paste. So I do think there's a lot of clunkiness around there that's still being smoothed out for a lot of individuals. But I'm seeing more and more people just use it daily, right? Like you can tell it via how the code's written. Jesus, there's so many emojis in some of these LLMs. It's wild. I, I don't know who's using emojis in their code. I guess maybe I'm just old. Definitely, it's not a natural thing for me to see when I see people do it. But I also see people who are struggling to learn how to debug because of this. Like on the flip side, like debugging is like this weird skill where 
honestly, I will talk to people and when they tell me their error, I generally can be like, oh, that's probably because of this error, right? Like uh, one example recently was someone told me, it's like, oh, it I, like the file is here and it can't find the file, right? Like I don't get why it can't find the file. And I'm like, well, probably a permission issue, right? Like that's generally the thing I have, or at least that's one of the things that I check is like, do I have permission to look at this file? Right. Because that's generally a big thing, right? If you don't have permission, you, you do that. Like that's like your natural first instinct, at least mine is like, do I have permission to access this file? There's a few other things you might check in there. Obviously you might've put some space, some somewhere weird, but I think there's just this like natural flow that you go through as you're debugging that you create over time, right? Like to have this like natural sense of like, what could the problem be? If I'm doing this nested loop, is it somewhere in there? And you can kind of look over things and, and kind of get that sense for it. And so I, that is one of the things like AI is changing workflows, but I'm c concerned about that capability to debug because again, mixed mixed results for me with, with using LLMs and Again, I use AI and LLMs too interchangeably, and I'm sorry for anyone who's watching this, right? I should really just say LLMs uh, most of the time. But yeah, those are like the big things I've seen uh, that have changed in the last uh, decade. There are some other things like Parquet seems to be the thing people go to even when it's not needed. I've just, I've seen some projects where like Parquet was used and I'm just like, your data is small. Like I, I don't really see a huge benefit personally, but you're doing it, I get it. It seems to be the way that people want to do it. There's some other uh, changes as well. But there are definitely changes in the way that we um, approach this data world and things will change in five or 10 years from now. Like everyone always asks me, should I learn this skill? Is this skill going to be around in five or 10 years? And except for a few of them, right? Most of them or most of the tools are going to be different. Again, Airflow is taken over. It will probably be different in 10 years, I imagine. It'll have all this AI functionality and LM functionality. And that could be a place that we go to. Like it's not that it couldn't happen, but things can change so drastically. And in 10 years, I hope they do. I hope we've grown and, and done a lot of new things and made things easier that they will change. But the thing that doesn't change is if you are willing to solve hard problems, technically speaking, like they're always going to exist. If those hard problems don't exist and we're just sitting around doing nothing, a lot of us who are going to be really bored. And I think, uh, I think it's hard for me to imagine a world where there aren't technical problems that someone has to solve. So I always sit on that fact that like if you can learn the ability to look at a problem, solve it with the skills that you have or learn the new skills required to solve it, um, there will always be a job for you somewhere. With that, hopefully this video helps you understand what has changed, what I've seen in the change in the last decade. Maybe you can kind of see where the, tra the trajectory is going. Um, and I hopefully we'll see you all in the next one. Thanks all. Goodbye.